infuriating beyond calculation, beyond politics, and beyond the big two. Welcome, Silver Liners, to Wednesday Wham! We've got a great show for you tonight. We've got a full house. I'm joined by the Empress of the Inks, Barbara Kalberg, the Paragon of Pencils, Rob Davis. We've got uh, both Wizards of Wordplay tonight. We've got Scott Wakefield and Rory Boyle. Glad and we've got, uh, yeah, yeah, believe it or not, and, and we have... Uh, uh, a, a really a, a non regular that, that I'm glad is here tonight. We have John Martin, uh, the, the Viking King, also known as Hawkman every now and then. King of the Hawkman, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> we have our fearless leader, head honcho and chief bottle washer, Mr. Roland Mann. Welcome, sir. Glad you're here. You. And last but not least, of course, our special guest, Steve Englehart, bona fide comic book legend. Welcome, Steve. Welcome. We're glad to have you tonight. I see you guys. I see you guys have a title called Trumps. Yes, we do indeed. I don't. I don't know if you know this story or not, but after Joe Staten and I did Millennium in 1986, the follow-up was going to be called Trumps. It was called. <laughs> it was called New Guardians in the end, oh. but, but it was wow. going to be called Trumps. Wow. And Jeanette okay. Kahn said, "Nope." Donald Trump would be upset if he did this. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was only a big wheel in New York at that time. But I you know, see. Wow. see. Wow. Big enough to wow. get her to back off. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, uh, I, bring him on. You bring know, on. Your, uh, your reputation precedes you. I was fortunate enough to be able to work with you in the early 90s. Yeah. On a book called The Night Man, yeah. uh, Roland was my editor at the time, and uh, we had a fantastic time on that project. It was uh, short-lived, but fun while it lasted. But uh, for those who may not know, I will throw out a few titles that you've worked on over the years, uh, some of the most signature story arcs in the 70s, and my personal favorites in The Avengers, Doctor Strange, Defenders, Batman, Justice League, just, you know, small stuff. Nothing. <laughs> um, Nothing so, Nothing you know, we've got, we've got so much to, to get started on, but I want, I, I want Roland to get us started here as, uh, uh, because I wouldn't even be here without, without Roland. He uh, gave me my first big break in uh, full color superhero comics way back in the early nineties. And I'd like to know how, you know, how you and Roland got together to, uh, to work on Nightman. I think that'd be a great place to start. Uh, Roland, how did that happen? So, I, I don't know. If, do you remember it, Steve? Well, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I know I do, but do you? It was, it was um, um, Chris Ulm and, and yes. um, Mason. Mason, Tom Mason, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and one other guy. I don't remember, but it was the, the guys, I think, who were higher than, than Roland. Yes. Who, yeah first you know came and asked me to work at malibu yeah and then when i worked at malibu i got editors and, and yeah <laughs> yeah and it was, uh, was rolling you know yeah it was Chris, <laughs> so Chris to me it was just we, we just got assigned to work together i don't recall anything sexier than that yeah <laughs> yeah it was uh it was chris Ohm because uh, chris Ohm and i were both obviously fans of your work and uh, and we talked about it a lot. Now I was still wrapping up when the Ultraverse launched. I was still wrapping up the Protectors. Mm -hmm. So there was Protectors, Dinosaurs for Hire, X Mutants. There was a, a line of other titles that were still finishing. So mm -hmm. I was still wrapping up those. So I didn't. I don't. I didn't come onto Nightman and Strangers until I, I think around issue four of both issues, uh, of both titles somewhere around in there. Um, but now I kind of got involved in some of the earlier things like the the conferences and things like that before yeah. I was actually an editor. Okay. Yeah. The, the now, conference was great. I mean, yes. Yeah. Steve, I wanted to uh, also bring up the fact that one of my favorite aspects of your characters and your story arcs <clears throat> was the fact that you brought in mysticism and the supernatural. I mean, obviously when you have a title like Dr. Strange, that's expected. But even in the other titles, uh, you had this fascinating character called Mantis, and she she had a mystical sense to her, even though she was a martial arts character. But even in uh, Shang-Chi, 
you, you always brought this cool aspect of there was there was a spiritual aspect, an intangible mysticism that revolved around the characters. Now, I know that you know when I was reading comics in that time period, that was heavily in the zeitgeist. That was in the pop culture. Uh, mysticism, supernatural, and, and horror comics were a lot more popular then, and the gothic feel of that tone was more prevalent. But tell me a little bit about uh, was that just something you, that comes naturally to you, or were you interested in, you know, the supernatural and mysticism and that sort of thing? Well, I imagine I was sort of headed in that direction because of comics, with, you know, all the right. stuff that you, I mean, even before just comics in general, you know, mm -hmm. you're sort of stretching the bounds of reality. Um, no, but it was when I, when I started writing Doctor Strange in his own book, I had done him in The Defenders, where I had treated him mostly as like a superhero who does spells out of his palms rather than sure. light rays or whatever. Sure. Um, but when I started writing his own book, I thought this guy's the sorcerer supreme of Western magic. I really ought to know something about that. I, you know, right. I never had a problem doing research for for characters. So I I went down to a store in, in New York. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, Wiser's, but it was the big occult store. And I just went in. I said, I know nothing, but give me some stuff to start with. Where would I start, you know? And I found that I was interested in it as a thing in and of itself, you know? So um, I've been interested in, in magic and the supernatural ever since Doctor Strange, but I, you know, but I wasn't particularly going in that direction beforehand. But that was right. that was a while ago now. So yes, I've I've used that what I you know what I got out of that in many other places. So when you when you would write the the outbursts of Doctor Strange, you know, obviously Stan had written, you know, by the hoary hosts of Hagoth and, and right. all that sort of thing. Did you have fun like coming up with new ones? What like did Yeah, you well just... I mean I I tended to use the old ones too. I mean, you know, yeah. there was you know, it's like if you want to draw Doctor Strange, you have to look at Ditko. I mean, that's oh, just, yeah. oh, you just, you know. Um, so if I'm going to write a character, I'm going to I'm going to take what we know about him and use him. But because I was ex sort of expanding the magical world that he was in, I did come up with other, you know, other spells and so forth uh, as, as we went into unknown places. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I liked him as a character. I... I get this out of the way I like pretty much all the characters that i wrote yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah yeah you know i mean you you sit by yourself in a room if you're a writer and and if you're not entertaining yourself day by day you're, you're in the wrong business so uh, <laughs> I, you know i i um any character i had i, I tried to find out what it makes this guy somebody in particular with dr sure. Creech, that was easy Sure. Uh, a lot of people may not know this about Steve, uh, but he started out actually as an aspiring artist. And actually, you did some art uh, and worked yeah. with uh, one of my greatest influences, Neil Adams. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about about how you, you, you broke in and got involved with some of those guys over there. Well, um, real quickly, I... I when I was still in college, I, my college was a couple hours outside New York. And one day I just took off from classes and went to New York. And I went to Marvel and said, hi, you know, I'm a fan. And they kind of looked at me and go, yeah, well, we're a small company and we don't have any, you know. This was, this was like 66. So this was wow. before fandom, mm -hmm. before conventions. Sure. You know, I mean. You were the so, little fanboy. So Marvel said, "Well, we love you, but we got, we can't, we don't can't spare anybody to do anything." So then I went across town. I went to D.C. and they also were like, "Yeah, well, um, I don't know. Do you want to talk to Julie Schwartz?" Like, sure. So, sure. It's not easy Twist my arm. So they sent yeah, me in, yeah. and Julie gave me a half hour of his time, and we talked. I just wow. I'm sure I was just you know fanboying out on the whole thing. Um, and I and I love to tell this story because it'll never happen to anybody else. But uh, when we got done, Julie said, "Well, there's a whole bunch of original art on the on the shelves right behind you. You can have some if you want." No way! Oh, whoa! So I, yeah. got, I got brave and bold That's Justice League pages out of that. 
Oh, oh how oh. awesome. Wow. And I still have them. They're not Man. for sale. All that oh, <laughs> any, any art that I picked up along the way is just part of my fan journey. You know, it's, people have asked, but no, not for sale. Um, wow. But anyway, so I came out of talking to Julie, and I just had this epiphany. It's like, these guys are not demigods. Mm. They're just people yeah, doing, sure. you know, doing this job. So I could do this job. Um, so later on, after I got out of college and all that, um, I went to Neil, hunted him down at D.C. He used to, like, work late at, at D.C. on Friday nights. He liked their light uh, box and, and <laughs> projector and so forth. Um, so I went, I, you know, I, I just went up to him and I said, when I, you know, at some point I'd really like to work with you. And he said, well, how about now? <laughs> and I, you know, I said, "Oh well, you know, blah blah blah." But he was just the nicest guy. Neil, Neil was the nicest guy. Um, uh, you know, by all accounts, by many accounts, wasn't always the nicest guy in later years. But <laughs> but he was just he was just a wonderful guy, and and took me on, even though you know he could see that I was pretty rudimentary as an artist, but he wanted to give me a way into the business. He insisted that I get a credit on a story in Vampirella that he, you know, was doing the art on. But I mean, I helped on the art, but I mean, he insisted that his assistant get a credit so that I'd have a credit. So when I went out into the world, uh, I mean, he just, it was great. So, um, and also I'm sure I absorbed a lot of Neil's attitudes about comics. Um, which were combative even then, you know. So, um, you know, some of my celebrated departures from companies are probably because of what I learned from, from Neil. Um, but, you know, I mean, so that then I was in the business. I had a credit, you know, I was doing art stuff and, and, I mean, to wrap this up, I mean, I eventually got a, a the lowest editorial job at Marvel. Um, Gary Friedrich had had it, but he went to New York or he went to Missouri, where he was from, for the summer and asked me to fill in. And they, Marvel, I think, the, I think it was a hundred or hundred and ten a week payment for this. Um, but there was seventy two, and you know that would take you a reasonable distance. But you could also get as much freelance work as you could handle. And so um, they started, you know, I, I ended up writing a script that Gary didn't want to write, and they liked it, and I liked writing it. And so then they started giving me more stuff, and then they liked that, so then they gave me more stuff, and then all of a sudden I was a writer and had no time for art after that. <laughs> so <clears throat> you transitioned, I think, from – that artist to writer, but it wasn't directly into superheroes, was it? No, no, because Marvel still published romance books and Western books and, and mm -hmm. monster books mm -hmm. uh -huh. in those days. Uh, and so you that's where you could serve your apprenticeship to, you know, all right, now write stuff for publication, but not superheroes yet. You know? <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah. So that was kind of cool. And I, you know, yeah. I even drew some of the romance stories. You know, I was still oh, cool. a hybrid at that point. Um, wrote through whatever, um, and eventually they said, "Okay, now you can have a superhero." So that's cool. Yeah. Do you still write uh, with the pseudonym Ann Spencer every now and then? Just to no, just to <laughs> just to... <laughs> that was a one-off. That, that uh, brings up a question I'd like to ask. Sure, go ahead. Bob. Um, go. Can you tell me what was behind the pseudonyms John Harkness and Cliff Garnett? Um. Uh, I can tell you better about it. I will answer your question, but I mean, Ann Spencer, my sister's name was Ann and she married a guy from Spencer, Indiana. So that's where that, when I was writing romance books, that's where that came from. John Harkness yeah. is just a name. When I was in high school, we had a really boring history teacher. I'm not sure what the teacher was, um, but we had to do a book report and, you know, it, it, speaks to my character i suppose but i decided i didn't want to write the book report i wanted to make up a book report so <laughs> I, 
And I wrote this book report about this imaginary book written by a guy named John Harkness. Um, oh no! Yeah. And, that, and that became that became my pseudonym. Um, and he bought off on it. The guy bought off on it. But I tried it a second time, and he was <laughs> not so much of that. Okay. <laughs> and and then the Cliff uh... Garnett thing. Um, I got contacted by I don't even remember what company it was, but one of the you know. They were going to start, it was a paperback house, and they were going to start a series to kind of go against, it's not the Punisher, what's the guy, there was some guy who was big in his paperbacks, the Destroyer, or, or somebody who, you know, did a, 200 books about fighting sure. in Vietnam and whatever that sure. was. They wanted, to, they wanted to compete with that, so they got five different guys to write stories about these characters that they'd come up with. And the house name was Cliff Garnett. So um, That's that cool. was me doing the Cliff Garnett one, doing oh. one of the ones under Cliff Garnett. So there's under five Cliff. of you. There's five yeah, there Cliff Garnett. Five five <laughs> that I is wrote, fascinating. I only wrote one of them. Um, that's old school, right? I mean, to get to get a Ghost house writing. name and hire people to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ghostwriting, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other, it, it seemed like a cool thing to take a shot at. I mean, I, it didn't. The series didn't take off, and that, I don't know that I would have wanted to. I don't think I would have wanted to do this on a regular basis. But it was kind of cool to write one of those things. You know? Did you use mm -hmm. John, John Harkness anymore? Yeah, John Harkness was in comics. Whenever, um, whenever I there would be something that I did that I didn't. It started out if I thought I just really didn't get it this time. I really didn't do up to my standards. I would say it was by John Harkness. Oh, you pawn um, it off. I see. Ah. But, but later, <laughs> but later, um, I mean, when I was leaving Marvel and Marvel was, was turning into a merchandising house rather than a, rather than a comic book house, um, I used John Harkness for a while and then I turned it into SFX Engelhart, which stood for sound effects, because that's all I was. I couldn't do any real <laughs> stories anymore. I was just doing, you know. Sound. So, and, and it was interesting because I was, I was really sort of like telling Mark yeah. what I thought about all of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they let me get away with it, you know. I mean, so that was all right. Um, well, there's, there, there's something I wanted to ask you. This is a, this is a little known crossover story. That a lot of people may not know about you. It's it's a it's a behind the scenes crossover that uh, you were involved in that revolved around a, a Halloween parade right. that was uh, equally visited by creators from from the different companies. Tell us a little bit about that. I think that story is so cool. Well, Rutland, Vermont, had a Halloween parade to keep the kids from wandering around in the dark in Vermont, I guess. And and the guy who was in charge of it, Tom Fagan was a big comic book fan. And so he kind of steered it toward Halloween costumes. And I think he probably wrote to the companies. I'm not real sure, but um, various people at the companies, the first year was Neil and Denny O'Neill, uh, Al Weiss, I think Wrightson again. Um, they all went up to the thing and they came back and they said it was really a lot of fun. They really liked uh -huh. it. So uh -huh. the next year, um, us Johnny come lately's went and I went up there. I had a car, so I drove Jerry Conway and Len Ween and Len's wife at the time, Glennis Ween. Um, and we had a wonderful time. It was, you know, it was fun. It was, it was, um, again, this was 72, maybe 71, even. I'm not real sure, but I remember coming there was a big party at Tom Fagan's house for the visiting people and everybody else who was invited. And I was upstairs for whatever reason. And I came downstairs and walked into this hall ballroom or open room. And there was, everybody was in costume. This was before cosplay. This was, I mean, people didn't wear costumes to comic book shows if there even were any, which I guess Phil Suling started them in like 69 or something like that. But there still weren't very many shows. And you never, I mean, you didn't see a room full of people all in costume. I, that just blew my mind. That, I was uh -huh. like, whoa. I, you know. <laughs> um, so anyway, somewhere along that 
weekend, I said to Len and Jerry, well, we could do this thing. And I'm sure it's my idea just because it's like <laughs> weird. So I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think Len or Jerry would have, would have come up with it. Although I wouldn't swear to it if they, if they wanted to uh, claim it. But um, the idea was let's do this crossover. The three of us write books. Let's do this thing where they all go to this Rutland Halloween parade. And Jerry was writing Thor, uh, and I was doing The Beast. But that was, I might have been doing other stuff. By then, I think I would have been doing other stuff in Marvel, but I was doing The Beast. And Len was doing The Justice League, which was a whole different company. Um, but we all said, yeah, let's do that. And so those three stories, we could never announce it officially, but I mean, Steve and Len and Jerry and Glennis and my, and my Mustang. <laughs> we awesome. wander through all three of those stories and if you put them in the right order you can sort of see us get involved in one story and then walk out and then walk into the next story and get involved in it and walk out and walk into the next story and walk out again um, and it you know so that's great. I, it had yeah, that's fun of, of, that's fun it, that's, well, that's I mean, awesome see, that's, that's, I love that. I mean, I was the new guy on the block. It wasn't like I'd been around for 30 years and had done this ever before. But, um, you know, we all got caricatured by Marie Severin at Marvel, and we all got caricatured <laughs> by Dick Dillon over at, at DC. And that was cool to get you know, yeah. to see all that stuff. Um, but, let's say, comics were always fun for me. I was always looking for what would be, you know, I mean... You had to sell it. You had to, you know, meet your deadlines. You had to do that kind of stuff. But I mean, if you could do that, then what? What could you do to make it special for the readers? You know, to make it right. fun for you, any of that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, really, I, I look back on that now and I go, "Wow, <laughs> really? I came up with that." I mean, it's just like that's pretty weird for the you know, for a guy who's new to the business, but. <laughs> So you were new to the business and we're, we're talking around the early 70s here and you're just getting sort of into Doctor Strange and then the Defenders and then into Avengers. When you get a signature book like that, and obviously the, the run was so well received, but did you have a lot of editorial oversight or did you feel like I've made it, I can play, I can do what I want. As long as the book is selling, they're going to let me roll with it. How did, well, how that, did was, that work? Well, that was the specific instructions from Roy Thomas, who was the editor. I mean, again, this is, I got to back up. But when, when Stan decided he needed assistance, he hired Roy and he hired Denny O'Neill. And he drilled them. They had to sound like him because he said <laughs> everything had sounded like him. And he didn't want to have suddenly new voices in the Marvel universe. And so they got rigorously drilled about that. But when Roy took over to his credit, he said, you guys can do whatever you want to do. He said, I, I, you know, we've got more. It was Marvel was expanding, expanding, expanding. He said, I've got all these books. I've got no time to be like drilling the writers in addition to everything else. So his specific instructions were, if you can sell it, if you can make it sell and you can turn it in on time every month, then you can keep doing it. And if you can't do one or both of those, then we'll fire you and we'll get somebody else. That was, <laughs> that was, that was, entire, wow. that was the awesome. entire editorial oversight. So, yes, wow. I, I felt like I could do anything because I was I was meeting my deadlines and the books were selling. So I, I had no constraints in my brain about. I can't do this or, you know, it might get weird or editorial. Um, and, and that proved to be true. I mean, Roy never, you know, um, Roy never said, don't do that or do it differently or whatever. When I came to him and said, I want to do the Avengers cross the Avengers defenders thing over the summer where I was going to do both of those books and weave the story between them. He said, you realize if you're late on just one of them, the whole thing will topple over. And I said, I won't be late. And he said, okay. And that was, you know, oh, that's wow. it. That's all That's all there was. And and I would just say along those lines, when Steve Gerber and I got together at Malibu later on, the original Malibu approach was very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it did 
ossify a bit over time. But Gerber and I were just, we, it was like the lobster or the, the frog in the boiling water or whatever. I mean, we'd gone on, we'd both gone on from Marvel to do other stuff, you know, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, wait a minute. This is the way that it was. This is the mm-hmm. way it was when we first started, um, which, you know, we obviously love. <laughs> Malibu, Malibu seemed to have figured it out. Well, that's yeah. uh, something that we, we discuss here in the, in the podcast a lot is that <clears throat> it seems like today there's, there's a different approach where a lot of the creators feel there are taboo areas. There are areas that must not be discussed, there are areas that must be discussed. There's, there's politics. There's all this sort of thing swirling about. And um, number one, what I noticed – in those days reading comics, um, there was no, it it went everywhere. Anything could happen. It was a wide open field. It was pure escapist fantasy. And that is precisely why it was so compelling to me as it, you know, cause I was the the target. I mean, I was a teenage kid and you know, anything that was fantasy, sci-fi monsters, superheroes, shoot them ups, beat them ups, you know, whatever it was, you know, martial arts, loved it. It was great. Did you at any time feel or feel influenced by editorial or even by the culture around you to, well, I'd better include this or not include this? Or did you think, no, if I think it's cool, that's the filter? Well, no, I was aware of social conventions and and politics and all the stuff that was going on around. I mean, but comics, again, I started, it was still under the comics code and it was still on newsstands. It wasn't a specialty item at a specialty shop. They was just sitting there on any street corner. You could buy comics Um, and they were for everybody. I mean, and you, and so you couldn't scare the children, but at the same time you were trying to write stuff that, that college age kids and above would find, interested right i mean yeah. that was that was part of the of the thing um so i never again there was never any editorial thing i one thing that i that i regret now and you know people can take this the way they want to but um I got a letter one day from somebody who said, well, there's never been like a real heroic Christian character. Christians Mm -hmm. are always shown to be sort of wimpy guys, you know. And I said, oh, well, that's not fair. So I created Firestar, Firestorm, Firestar, I don't remember, (laughs) Um, um, to do that. But then later I thought, you know, there's, that's the, that's the whole right wing ethos is like oh we're not being treated fairly you know you need to you need to let us have equal space in the whole situation um as far as the comic book character goes it didn't make any difference as far as as far as politics goes it makes a huge difference but so i was a little i was a little unhappy that i had done that because i'm not sure that you know i'm not sure that it played out well politically Right. You know, right. I'm, I'm a liberal. What can I tell you? <laughs> but I mean, I can, I can create that character. I can, I sure. can have my fun and do my, and do my do work on that character. But sure. I, but that was a case where I sort of thought, you know, I should do this as a, you know, responsible person. And then I'm not sure that I should. Have, but, you know. <laughs> well, there, you know, I know there's a few I... questions. Uh, there's a few questions in the chat uh, when you get a chance to get to them. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'll pop them up there for you if you want to. Oh, please. Yes. Um, I collected everything. I collected everything before I became a professional. When I became a professional, everything was given to me for free. Um, (laughs) um, And then after I stopped doing comics, I was I was pretty much done with comics. Um, So I'm not going after anything today. And, And part of it is, well, two things. One, uh, if somebody comes up to me and goes, man, you really need to read this thing, I go down to the comic book store and it's sold out. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? <laughs> right, right, if it's right, that right. popular, it's not there by the time I, I your copy. Right? 
Um, right. <laughs> and and uh, so, uh, yeah, I. And I'll say one other thing that you know may apply to this, and also might be interesting to you guys. Um, when I went to the Doctor Strange premiere in a couple months ago. I was sitting next to some guys who can remain nameless, but they're doing comics now. The the guy that I'm about to mention said he was doing both commercial, I mean, you know, Marvel or DC stuff and also independent stuff. And at one point he said, but I feel like I got here too late. Mm. Everything's already been done. Which was uh. like, that was a weird, you know, I've not heard that concept before. And so I throw that back at you guys. Have you ever, you know, felt like that or? or That's why know? we have Silverline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have so much to do. Are you kidding me? We don't have enough, uh, yeah. have enough days. And we've got our so ideas many done. stories, no. man. Okay. I, I, so I, I, I feel like people, people are stuck in that mindset. And we're the ones trying to pull them out of, like, the readers, pull them out of, Re picking up the same character mm -hmm. month after month mm -hmm. after month and saying, "Hey, what about this? It's not. It's not stuck to uh, its past. Uh, the corporate idea of what this story or this character needs to follow, because we're creating something new. That that that's me. And I don't, okay. I don't know if that's how Roland feels. Or yeah, uh, but well, I mean, if you guys feel like you're doing something that hasn't been done before, then 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 good. You know, I mean. Since I'm not in comics, I'm not in a position to have an actual opinion <laughs> about that. I just thought that was... I think you've contributed enough thought, to have an opinion. <laughs> yeah. I just thought there's a guy that's a, it, just an interesting thing for this guy to say to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's defeat before it's even started. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan asks, what are your thoughts on the Doctor Strange movies? And he also asked earlier, what's your favorite comic book movies of the current era uh, if you um, have one well i like i like basically all the doc, all the marvel movies i mean that's an honest opinion they're fun mm -hmm. they're not exactly the way i would have done them you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but i mean sure they're doing good work in their own yes. in their own situation so sure. um i've got i've got quibbles here or there some places yeah. where i do quibble but the Doctor Strange stuff. I think I think Benedict Cumberbatch looks like Doctor Strange. Oh yes, so he does. really looks mm -hmm. great. Yeah, Strange. he does. He does. And um, everybody, everybody knows here that I think that Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, and we um, concur. We concur. Uh, I would say his American accent is a little more American than I might think I would be hearing from Doctor Strange. I would think yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, it's more British. It, it, no, yeah. but a little more. Culture. I mean, just mm. it's sort of a broad, oh, middle of the road American accent he's got. And mm -hmm. this guy was a New York doctor, so I kind of see. Plus, he went to Tibet for years and years. I don't yeah. see him being quite That's that funny. just <laughs> American. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, but I really like the movies. Um, yeah. I thought the first one was really good. I uh, the second one, I thought the fan service in the middle where we introduced the five other characters so that Wanda could kill them. Yeah. It was cool that she killed them, but the movie kind of stopped for 20 minutes while we introduced yeah, yeah. all these guys. Yeah. 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 And Strange is still yeah. standing there in that, you know, talking to these guys and yeah, things didn't move at that point, but I understand why they did, you know, but it's, sure. but you know, could have, could have done something. There. But, and I really love the part where he goes through the, where he and, and, and America go through the, different um uh -huh. realities and the one yeah. where he turned yes. paint where they turned into paint i'm going what the hell is that and then they referenced it later right <laughs> so that he cool. had, he thought it was weird too but i yeah. but whoever those guys were sitting in some you know studio in southern california or taiwan or wherever the hell they are but whoever made that yes, earned their money that, that, was, yeah. you know, <laughs> that was fantastic that was amazing so uh, yeah as know. as the as the co-creator of Shang-Chi, um, you know, being a child of the seventies, there was a feel to that character. Um, it was very much like the television series Kung Fu. And I have a two part question of this. Number one, were you guys instructed to create something similar to that series? Cause I know Warner brothers on that series, or was that just something that was cool to you that you wanted to create. It was 
that's the second one. Starlin and okay. I, Starlin and I watched that TV show and really liked it. Yeah, we said, I did too. We want to go. We want to do because I was writing Doctor Strange and I had immersed mm -hmm. myself in Western magic, and the mm -hmm. whole idea of doing Eastern philosophy mm -hmm. was worked for me because it was something new to explore. It was also not right. like anything else I was doing, so I wasn't you know, like having to repeat myself or anything. Um, and Starlin, I think, like both the philosophy and the um, um, the martial, the art possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But so we went to Marvel and said, we want to do this book. And, and again, it was, it was Roy, uh, who was the editor, who said, I don't see any purpose to this book at all. I don't, there's no <laughs> cares about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and and so but we were kind of we really wanted to do it and and so we negotiated with him and he sort of grudgingly allowed us to do it so long as we put Fu Manchu in it because to Roy Fu Manchu was a a major character and it, this was a Chinese guy so here's a major Chinese character you know Roy's into the pulp he's into the 40s yeah mm -hmm. sure pulp stuff thing. sure um, sure and uh, and also shang -Chi had to be half white. Um, on the TV show, David Carradine had to be half white because ABC right. said you can't do a story about an Asian person. Got to right. have some connection to white people. And Marvel had the same philosophy. And I can't tell you if it was a correct philosophy. Um, I do know that there were parts of the South where Luke Cage was not carried. So, yeah. you know, it's like, I never make knew of that, that what you will, but but we I so then we had to put in. I bought it. I never knew that. Yeah, I didn't either. I bought it in Mississippi. <laughs> well, it was it was parts of the South, from oh. what I was told. But in any event, uh, when we agreed to do that, Roy agreed to let us do this book. So we did this book, and they put it in the most obscure place possible. I mean, it was in episode issue sixteen of special marvel edition which had been a bad reprint book i mean it was like but right after that kung fu as a philosophy as a concept just exploded and it's not because of us we you know we weren't out there long enough to have been the effect we just were kind of the canary in the coal mine i mean we thought this sounds cool and then it turned out to be extremely cool but the problem was that marvel then turned right around and they created iron fist Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, they said, we're going to uh, going to make this bi-monthly book monthly and we're going to add a black and white magazine and we're going to do annuals and we're going to do specials. And I had envisioned a bi-monthly book where I could go through philosophy. And so, you know, after three issues, Starlin bailed. And after five issues and two issues of the black and white, I bailed. Um, and then it was kind of in limbo for a year until Doug Mensch and Paul Glacey figured out what they wanted to do with it. And then it became this really wonderful series under those guys. I mean, you know, a different series, but a real, uh -huh. you know, that run was fabulous. Um, somebody says it had Sergeant yeah. Fury reprints. So. Yeah, Sergeant Fury uh, re reprints. So it wasn't all bad. No, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't yeah. All bad. Hyper is a Sergeant Fury fan, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, um, and, the, and the interesting thing there is, at the time, it meant nothing to me, really, putting Fu Manchu in that book, making right. him half white. But, of course, now, um, right. the star of the movies won't sign any of those books because they're racist. It's like, mm -hmm. well, and I, you know, and I have loved the fact um, that wow. many articles who came out, which came out at the time of that movie, said, yeah, Master of Kung Fu, created by Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin. Yeah, it was racist. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, oh, wonderful. Yeah. You know? What? Nothing you know? what? what? but a shark and jumping. So you That's can, just you know. ridiculous. Well, I, uh, yeah. both of those, but, but uh, so both of those statements are true, I guess, you know, but uh, they're not connected in, in real life. Anyway. Yeah, well, it was. How, how did you think the movie turned out? Because it's, it had a different feel uh, yeah. to me. It did. No, I liked. I liked the movie, except mm -hmm. for the ending. I, you know, right. I'm sure they're kind of at the point where they want to position everybody. But I, but I, it's like, 
okay, you were sitting around in San Francisco parking cars, and then you got swept into this international thing where you're fighting dragons in an alternate dimension and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and when it's all over, you didn't have any response to that. You just went back to the bar and amused your friends. That's yeah. like, well, did, didn't that change your life somehow? So well, I, yeah. I thought, you know, and I think that was that, and the whole thing with Wong showing up and saying, you must come, blah, blah, blah. Right. I mean, that seemed like maybe they kind of tacked all that stuff onto the end. But I don't think yeah. it was a good decision to, you know, I would have this guy have been, have gone through something to have yeah. shown that he went through something. But uh, it was a fun evening at the movies, yeah. you know. Right? Sure, <laughs> sure. One of the one of the more appealing uh, components of the Shang Chi book, as as you guys originally envisioned it and created it, was that we learned about philosophy and tradition uh, of the fighting style and also some of the Chinese history yeah. and mysticism as we go through the story, just like the TV series. And uh, that's one thing that was really appealing to me about it. And I thought maybe they went too cosmic for, for my taste, a little too powerful, where I think something like Kung Fu might have worked better, more grounded. But again, you know, uh, I come from that era of watching that original TV series. So to me, that was that type of hero was a more grounded learning about life as he solves problems. Right. Well, we didn't want to just, you know, copy the TV show. Of course we not. Wanted course to, not. We wanted to take off, you know, in some directions that were suggested to us by the TV show. I mean, we've never sure. never been shy about saying we we watched the TV show and came up with this idea, but we didn't sure. want to just do the right. same thing. Right. It turned out good, though. I mean, it was it was powerful. I'm glad the character's doing well. There's another character a lot of people uh, may not know about is the Mantis character. Um, what did you think about their treatment of, of Mantis? <laughs> well, that's, that's my biggest... I mean, you're, you're hitting on all the things where, I, you know, where I've got a, a bone to pick. But, <laughs> I love uh, it. I love it. I, yeah. Again, not yeah. to the extent that I, that I don't like going to these movies. Right. Or think that they're not doing a good job, but you know the only thing in common between that mantis and my mantis is that they're both female. Yeah. Every other distinguishing characteristic is completely different. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I'm like, hmm. on the other hand, I like Palm Clementioff as that mantis. I like those movies. I like James Gunn's movies. You know, um, uh, so I had a good time at the movies, but I just sure. thought. You know, that was a character that I worked a long time on, was was involved with for a long time, and and having it changed, I, you know, I understand. I'm I'm smart enough to know I've paid enough attention. The last thing anybody making a movie wants is for the original writer to come up and go, "Well, I would have done it differently." You know, it's like <laughs> because they have their own, you know, they have their own yeah. dynamics, they have their own problems, they have to do whatever they have to do. Um, but I did ask James Gunn why he, you know, changed the character. And he said, well, I needed a character like that. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and, okay. And I do get royalties. I get royalties for her, even though she's not my character anymore. So, well, there you go. I mean, I, I, there are benefits to the whole thing. Sure. But as a, as a creator, I would have liked to have seen, you know, the actual man. But, yeah. Well, there, there have know. been some, there's been some, uh, content written about mantis that possibly she has re-emerged in other stories as other characters maybe lorelei right maybe some of the other characters that that have similar um backgrounds or mysterious origins or relationships to extraterrestrials etc do you want to expand yeah. on that that archetype that you carried well through? that was that was me being um Playful, whatever. Again, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, Clever. you know, I, I, I did this whole thing with Mantis for a year and a half, and then went on wrote the Avengers for another year and a half, whatever. And then I left Marvel, and and got hired to go over to DC and and do the Justice League and Batman. 
And I went to the San Diego Comic Convention that summer, and somebody came up to me and he said, does that mean there'll never be any more Mantis? And that made me think, why not? You know? So, sure. um, so I put Mantis in the Justice League, but I had to call her by a different name. Mm-hmm. And she's very, she's very playful and arch about saying the stuff that will let you know that it's her, but she can't say it, blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, well, hell, I'll put Mantis in every book I ever do. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so when I did Scorpio Rose uh, for for uh, Eclipse, I put her in there and I called her Lorelei. But then, you know, it turned out that sticking Mantis into every book I ever did after that is, is you know, it becomes a little more difficult each time to kind of explain what the heck so i mean that's where i stopped on that road um uh-huh. but i thought it was again i thought it was fun to put mantis in the justice league as long as you're having fun then that's that's, that's a success all, that's what matters yeah. well no it, 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 you guys have to have fun too as the readers i mean if, if the right. readers are going this guy's just tripping out and it's not, it's not a thing you know that's not what i'm shooting for at least you know um, I want to open the floor up, uh, Scott and Rory, as as uh, writers. I'm sure you guys have some writer-driven questions for our, Ooh, our yeah. guests tonight. So uh, fire away, my friends. Rory? Oh, yeah. So as a fellow writer, who would you say is the most intolerable to work with? <laughs> Artists, <laughs> inkers, Artists? pencilers, editors? <laughs> um, well, oh, Steve loves his editors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I. You're in a safe place. I've, you know, I mean, I've had I've had tough people in in all of those things. I don't. I. I mean, as a writer, you want the artist to understand what it is you're trying to do. Well, you want everybody involved in the process yeah, to understand yeah. what you're trying to do. But Same I way. have worked with artists. I mean. Um, when I was doing Luke Cage, as I'm still very low on the totem pole, um, I would come up with a story every month for Luke Cage, and I would send that to George Tusca, who was drawing it. And George, who was extremely old school, would go, yeah, I'm not feeling it. And I'd get back pages of a story that I didn't recognize. All right. Right? Wow. Um, and I'm not vibing I, today. I was... <laughs> I was way down on the totem pole. I couldn't go to Roy and say, you have to fire George Tuska because he's not drawing my stuff. So I learned that you can make anything make sense. I could take stuff. I kept having things that Luke Cage would never do, and I would have to think of a reason why he would do that, yeah. you know, and, and have it sound legit. And, and I've often said that it was good training as a writer to know, like, mm-hmm. You got to get there somehow, and and how's that going to work? But it was not fun, you know, at the time. Uh, and I was doing other books at that time with Luke Cage. I was doing the Hulk and the Avengers and the Defenders. And they weren't giving me any trouble, but yeah. you know. Um, so an artist who who sort of deliberately doesn't do what you ask him to do is, it, I mean, it's not easy to get past that. I mean, uh, an editor who says. Oh, you have to stick this thing in or take this thing out or something like that. That might, it's usually the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, right. all those original drafts, would you keep all those original drafts? Uh, no, I didn't. No. Um, but it, you know, but at least it's like, okay, you've just taken the story and you've done this to it, as opposed mm-hmm. to like the story makes no sense in the first right? Year, right? <laughs> so, um, that's that would be my answer. Artistic types. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Thanks. We else. love you too. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're super easy to work with. I mean, it's right. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, oh yeah. Oh, oh, just, yeah. Right. Well, I, you God's know, and I would also humanities. Another one along that line is when I did um, uh, Millennium for DC, and had this idea that every book in the line should all be tied together. Um, I made that as easy as possible on people. I just said, you know, just if you could just do this somewhere in your story, you know, we can make that. And everybody, you know, it's like, sure, okay, fine, I'll give it a shot. Except for one guy, John Byrne, who said, <laughs> uh, 
I'm not, not John's. I'm not doing that. You know, I'm going to do something else. And it's like, wow. Yeah, well, okay. you know, uh, Burns fairly well known for that sort of thing. Right. So, um, so that, you know, that stuff happened. But usually. When you were first getting started and the editors, as they want to do, would, just like the artist, like cut up what you had in mind and change it. Was that difficult? Was that, cause I've heard multiple authors say, you sent it off to the editor and it's like not the story you came up with. How do you right. get over that? Cause if, usually when you write something, you put a piece of yourself into it. There's some, there's some kind of attachment. Sure. So if they, especially if they get rid of that little piece, it feels like it's not yours anymore. Is it just that getting rid of that emotional attachment? That this is just a business. This is just. Yeah, it's somewhere in there. I mean, there is an emotional attachment and it is a business and I get that too. Um, um, yeah, I don't know that I have. I think that's all. <laughs> that. I mean, it's like hey, it's, you do this happens. long yeah. enough. I mean, it's like you, you better figure out that it's a business. But you still, right. I mean, you don't only, you're doing it because you have some interest in it because you have right. some you got some kind of passion for it. What you're trying to get, you know. Yeah, and you want something out of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Scott? Uh, Oh, oh, thank you, Rory. Uh, so, uh, Steve, um, my, my my question is uh, for for anybody just getting started. Uh, I always like to ask this question. Not us. Know, not us. Right. Right. Yeah. We're, 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 I'm, I'm well seasoned. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 If you could go back and either tell yourself some sort of pearl of wisdom, or or what would you say? Uh, to e either writers or artists, um, most of no it, artists. it doesn't need to be one thing. I'm just saying, what would what what are, what's some wisdom you would impart to someone getting into the industry and trying to succeed? Um, well, I mean, the industry is very different today. I don't know what yeah. the culture is like at Silver sure Line, and I don't really know what it's like at Marvel, but I hear things about Marvel, um, and DC. Um, but I. I would hope that you would be getting into this because it's something you want to do. You know, it's not like you're just doing it to pay the rent or really wish you were writing novels, but you know, you got to take this gig to get by. You know, I mean, I would hope that you like comics and that you want to do comics. Um, and then I would hope that you would be given the chance to do what it is that you want to do. I mean, again, I tell people I'm really lucky because of what I said before. I mean, I walked in the door and they said, you can hear, here, have Captain America. Now do anything you want to do with it. <laughs> oh, right? Man. Wow. I mean, wow. That was, that was the deal. So and we so, the Holy Grail. Do you want it? <laughs> 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 um, I, you know, not everybody gets complete creative freedom. And, mm -hmm. and we had it for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I never had to say, gee, is this too much? Should I stop here? You know, it was just like I could let whatever my imagination was doing run its course. And I also, I also say I was very lucky to have Sal Buscema, a fellow Floridian, um, as my artist on a, on a number of those books because Sal could draw anything, you know? It's like I never had to worry, does, can this guy draw horses? Can he do hands? You know, whatever. <laughs> It's like Sal could draw anything. So I was in this position where they said, do whatever you want. I did whatever I wanted. Sal drew it. You know, it's like the, everything just flowed really nicely. That's the ultimate. And so I would hope, um, I hope Roland's listening to this, that um, everybody gets <laughs> complete creative freedom. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but I mean, if you get into it, I hope you're able to like express yourself, you know, and it's possible you can express yourself and the readers could go, we don't want to hear that. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. then, then you get fired or, you know, whatever the deal is. But, but, you know, I mean, from the same people who said, gee, everything's already been done, comes the idea of, I mean, I saw a lot of this in the 90s, I thought. Where people go, man, I really liked that thing in comics when I was a kid. I'm going to recreate that. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm not going to create something. I'm not going to take off in a new direction. I'm just going to like hit that same pleasure center that I had before. 
none of that stuff interests me. You know, I mean, I want to see people doing new stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I would just say, don't be trying to fit it into somebody else's bailiwick. But I mean, that's assuming you can get away with that. If you're at a company where they want you to, everybody has to sound the same, you know, or whatever the deal is, then, then that's Roland, the Roland runs a tight ship here. He does not <laughs> allow. <laughs> Ooh, boy. He's... Look at, uh, right. yeah, everything has to run right past. No, uh, Fruit Bat <laughs> says there needs to be some editorial input, not huge. Yeah. But yeah, just we, enough, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, we we humor Roland. We like <laughs> we listen to Roland. <laughs> thank, a little thank bit. you, Roland. Yeah, yeah, so, Roland. yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm still gonna just do no, it. No, it, it's it's at the same with at the proofreading level too. Like anything you're gonna write, if it's worth someone else, if someone else is gonna see it, someone else has to see it first. It's right. in, in the editing yeah. level too, because it's all up here. Yeah. And then once it's out there, well, it makes sense to me. I wrote this. Of course. How do you? Why don't you understand what I wrote? And so yeah. yes, an editor needs to. Somebody else needs to see it yes. and say, uh, this, yeah. this may, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This may make sense to you. It all yeah. makes sense up here. Right. Yeah. 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 Agent so. Cub says, how does it feel oh. to be the one to introduce the comic industry to Todd McFarlane? <laughs> <laughs> that was just a weird, you know, I was doing, I was doing the book for, um, Epic Marvel's thing. And I needed artists. And mm -hmm. this guy showed me his samples, and I liked his samples, you know? I mean, so yeah, I hired him. I would also say I didn't hire, but I was just sort of handed a young guy named George Perez. I was handed a young guy named oh. you know, um, um, uh, Paul Galassi. I was oh, handed yeah. a young guy named Zine, Dean Zachary, right? I mean, yeah. it just a lot of that stuff was hey, just... Grant. Um, All right. uh, you know, you, you hope that you get to work with guys who are following that path I just mentioned about wanting to express themselves and doing stuff. And, and um, you know, Todd's stuff was pretty weak, whatever, when he started, but it was good enough. And then, you know, he became Todd McFarlane, but yeah. you never really know if people are going to do that. You just, you know... Well, if you like them and you can give them a job, then you give them a job. Well, you know that the, you you open the door to these people and look look what happened. I mean, it's, well, that's it's, what happened to me, right? I mean, Neil yeah. let me in the door, and then it right. turned out that I did whatever I did. You know, I mean, it's it's so I'm all uh, in favor. Of, that my, can I real quick? Thanks, that, my question is about. Um, uh, that Dean Zachary guy is good. Still needs a okay. Sergeant Rock from him. We can we can work on that hyper potato. So, that so Steve, <laughs> you got your foot in the door, and I, I and I'm a, I, I ask all these professionalism questions because I feel like, um, well, I'm I've been kind of like, it's frustrating to watch people not, uh, not do the right thing for their career, um, and they they kind of like throw it all away. You got your foot in the door, but that's. You, you, that's like I don't want to say that's that's the easy step. But that's like the first step, and then after that, that's the important stuff. That's where you really have to shine. Uh, so like, the what who did you, you know do versus the what you know? No, no, I'm saying it's it's okay. Someone gave you the chance, right? Someone yeah. someone took a chance on you, mm -hmm. right? What do you so? And then you saw you had that opportunity, and you kind of I don't know, took you didn't quite take chances, but you said okay. I'm going to give you the chance to draw once you had your, you know, you, once you were settled, once you were a name, once you had a, um, all those titles under your belt. Right. So what do you, what do you say to somebody who, who's been given that opportunity? You just have to do it. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, as, as, as simple as, as that is, um, I happen, you know, I happen to have a feel for comic books. I mean, it seems like I was able to write a bunch of comic books that people thought these are, you know, these are okay. The but, quarterback can hand you the ball. It's up to the they, running back. Barb, to there you well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Barb with the yeah, sports yeah. analogy yeah. again. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I got in a comic, so I didn't have to listen to those. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to well, you to run it past the goalposts. You, you've been led into the toy, to the room with all the toys. Yeah. Now you have to figure out how to assemble those toys into something that you want to play with. Right. Well, I would just, I would say, um, 
I did comics because I loved comics, and there was never a hint that there would be movies made out of them. Yeah. And yeah. then, mm-hmm. now, 50 years later, they're making movies out of them, and I'm getting royalties and all that good stuff. And I say to people, I'm just standing there. <laughs> you know, not a bad place to stand. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't scheme and plot to get Marvel movie money later yeah. on. You know, it's just like I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the world says, "Here, have some royalties." You know, have your name on the screen, all this kind of stuff. And I, and what I honestly say is, I'm just standing here, and 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 that, and then I have to usually sometimes have to usually sometimes add, but I did the work. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's that, kind of the there deal. It is. It's like, there it is. I, you it. know, I did the work that now they want to adapt. Right. So I did do that. But at the same time, I'm just a guy. You know, I mean, I'm not I'm not a demigod. I did, not you know, just a guy who was in the right place at the right time, who got to do stuff. And then and, and then, you know, 50 years later, something weird happened. So I you do have to do the work. I mean, you have to like you have to write comics that people really want to read. You have to draw yeah. comics that people really want to see. If you do that, if that's within your skill set, then then you know you should be fine. And 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 it, as you guys know, I mean, it builds, right? I mean, you do something, and then you get another shot, and then if you do that one okay, then you get another shot, and, and um, so. It's as simple. I mean, what what did Woody Allen say? Ninety percent of everything is showing up. Something, like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. That's it. I mean, you want to do comics, then then do some well, good comics, and yeah. and then you'll be happy. Everybody else will be happy. You know, maybe they'll question. be making Silver Line movies in fifty years. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Yes. 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 The I, fifty I, I, years. Yes, I probably <laughs> won't be here. Then, but okay. <laughs> I have a question for Steve. Yeah. Is there a dream project or story that you never got to tell? Not really. No. Um, I by re, by being a comic book writer, I tended to work on a on a monthly schedule, and I would off you know I would sometimes sometimes often um, work out some sort of overarching plot for something, but usually. I like to let the characters develop themselves and take me down roads that they want to go on and all that kind of stuff. And so I couldn't say, oh, next month I'll definitely be doing this because when I write this story, it might go in a different direction. So I always left myself the flexibility to do that. At the same time, I rarely thought much beyond, and even though, you know, you can look and I've got epics that ran for months and all this kind of stuff. So I had some sort of overall idea, but I, but doing it month by month was how it got done. But your own um, your own and, characters, maybe. Um, there's Original I really stuff? I, no I I'm I'm writing very strange. I'm still writing stuff, um, but not for publication per se. I mean, if somebody wants to publish it, Roland, um, you know that's. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. um, let's talk. I did. Yeah. I did. Um, I wanted to do a story when COVID hit, and and I was had much time on my hands, like a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, yep. I'd had this idea. I wanted to do a story. <laughs> I wanted to do a story about a town. You've got like twenty ongoing characters in this town, small town in Northern California, and all these different people with, from all these different walks of life, all having different life stories. And then one day something weird happens and two of them become a superhero and a superheroine. But I don't tell you which ones. Right? Oh, cool. And so oh. so we're doing yep. adventures yeah. of these superheroes. But meanwhile, these 20 people are still living their normal daily lives, except two of them have a secret that you don't know which one. And I said, I want to do that. And so I had a lot of time and I did it. And it ended up being, in order to have... T- ongoing stories because everybody's got a story not just the superheroes the other people have you know there's private eye sure. and there's love sure, stories sure. And there's all this different stuff going on and they all had to have their own individual stories and you know so it ended up being seven 60 page graphic albums it takes place <laughs> over the course of a week and it's seven and what and it wasn't it was a writing can I, can i do this can i make this work all these different storylines all at the same time all within this, 
comic book format of a beginning, a middle, and end, blah, 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 blah. Can I do that? And I did it, and it wasn't until I got done with it that I said, nobody's ever going to draw this. <laughs> 420 pages with multiple wow. characters, right? Hmm. It's not, nobody, I, I, even George Perez, at his most manic, would not want to draw that. <laughs> so it's this really cool story that I wrote, but it'll, you know, it'll never appear. Um, I did a, so then I followed that up. I wrote a story um, about a guy on the moon in the, in, you know, later 21st century when people do go to the moon, but he's like a miner up there, but he gets caught up in this kind of spy story on the moon. So you got cool visuals, you got, you know, a thing. And that one is actually, for what I, uh, I have an agent. I've had an agent for a long time for books and whatever else. And, and now, uh, since I'm not connected to any comic book company and haven't been for 15 years, um, he's shopping it around. And, and nice. Um, it's at another company at this point, you know, and we'll, you know, we'll see. Um, but again, it's like if nobody ever buys it, I still it, I wrote what I wanted to write, and mm -hmm. and and I'm and I am thankfully in a position where every once in a while, Mr. Disney gives me some money. So it's so I am thankfully in a position where I don't have to like sell this thing or die. Right. You yep. know? Right. Right. Which it's a nice me. place to be, isn't it? Yeah, it is, nice. you know. Yeah. And again, I'm yeah. just standing here. Right. I didn't do anything to, to you know. <laughs> I'm retired I, well, from the muggle world. I do this for more, you, more or less fun. You've you know? done, I, I done just, quite a bit. You built the foundation. That, That's that, right. That the, house, the house just appreciated in value. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I heard a story about Merv Griffin getting a... Uh, Getting a check for royalties <laughs> yeah. for the Jeopardy do 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 tune oh, yeah. for for ringtones, and he yeah. called up his agent. Ooh. He said, "What the hell's a ringtone?" <laughs> <laughs> He's getting a check for like a hundred thousand dollars. He has no idea. What <laughs> That's <more>. awesome. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. Awesome. <laughs> I'm not saying no. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, James Davis says, uh, "Is there a character or group you created for another company?" That you wish you could purchase the rights for and then self-publish. That, that, that Roland, sounds like. What a, do you think that could be? Really, that sounds like <laughs> a really baited question, doesn't it? It does. Uh, oh, I would man, love to. I would love to see the Ultraverse come back. I would love to write Yay! Strangers yes! and Yay! 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 And I right. and I honestly don't think it's ever going to happen. How um, much would it cost? Not um, sorry. for a while, anyway. How much would it it's cost? Checked. It's Marvel. Well, Marvel owns it. Marvel, <laughs> Disney owns it. Yeah. Right. And so, and I, the only hope I have is that one day Disney looks in the drawer and goes, we own all these guys. Why aren't we doing anything for them? You know? Mm -hmm. But, yeah. I mean, I some some of this you guys may know, some of you may not. But three different times, Marvel, well, let me put it differently. Tom Brevoort came to me in 2001 and said, we're going to bring the Marvel, the Malibu characters into the Marvel universe. I want you to write this book. Right. And, and I worked up a plot line. I took all the cool Malibu characters, you know, put them all together. I mean, the, it was, it was the flip side of what Dean and I were doing in the, in the Nightman thing. Um, I thought, I mean, Nightman split into two characters and I really mm -hmm. wanted to do, a Malibu Nightman and a Marvel Nightman. Yeah. Where they would at that point they split. They would start to go off in different directions and they would soon oh, be yeah. two different guys, except they're the same guy at the start. And and that didn't happen. But that was gonna happen. And then I mean I worked up a complete crazy how it was gonna work. They wanted to know what are the first twelve issues, which I really hate because I just explained I don't like to think. I don't want to get yeah. to issue 12 and just be checking the boxes. Oh, yeah, I sure. said I was going to do this. Um, but I did all that, and we got that far, and then they said, nope, we're not going to do that. And then there was another time where an assistant editor came to me and said, I'm trying to get the Malibu characters to come back, and I'm going to see if I can get, you know, I'm going to work in the system here and, and you know, just let you know. And three weeks later, I got an email from him, and he said, they told me it was worth my job if I pursued this. Mm -hmm. So uh, Marvel <coughs> really decided 
that those characters will never appear. And I and I believe it's because of the contracts, which is that the the writer and artist get a percentage of the money from the books, mm -hmm. right? That's probably right. And it's been explained That's to me. That's probably right. You know, if they if they said, okay, we'll do Nightman, and and Steve and Dean are going to get some money, the guy I'm writing fine. the X Men would show up the next day and go, I want the same deal, right? And then mm -hmm. they'd have to give it to everybody. So. The, the story that you always hear is, oh, there's something in the contract where we can't do this. But I'm sure that it's because of the individual contracts and the and the percentages that would be paid out. Um, so again, Marvel was adamant. Marvel was, I mean, this guy, he was serious. He said, they told me that I would get fired if I tried to pursue this thing. Marvel was adamant that they're never wow. gonna go there. Um, maybe Disney will, but to answer the question, I would love to see, you know, the Ultraverse back in business. Yeah. There were some great there. books in the Ultraverse. With you there. there oh, yeah. There yep. were. Yeah. I was Dean's inker from Nightman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The whole time? Yeah. I, I was I was getting talks to no. do. Uh, what no, was, the, what was the, the Iron Man-like character? Was that? Prototype. Uh, Prototype. Yeah. Prototype. yeah I, he was talking to me about doing him. And I... I, I and, uh, then things fell apart, unfortunately, because I think that would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, because that was an interesting book. Yeah, yeah, it was. That was fun. I got to do a cover for they that, were, Rob. That yeah. was a good. And you know who inked me on that cover was Terry Austin. Oh Boy, my I was god! Oh, Fanboy of Terry Austin. Too. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, yep. that's yep. cool. Yeah, I had but the yeah, unique that, uh, that... opportunity to, for that, but also to work with uh, Dick Giordano and yeah. Sal Bashima also. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it just it was a great time. The Ultraverse yeah, period was the fanboy. The fanboy inside you was going. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I always said. I mean, this is my understanding, but I mean, when Marvel went bankrupt, they took everybody down with them, and Malibu was the last one to run out of money. Yeah. Uh, mm. But they did run out of money, and then you know, Marvel really liked their coloring department. Yeah, the other Photoshop me out. Uh, that was pretty cool. <laughs> So they bought them for the coloring department and stuck all the characters in the book. And then all the coloring department guys left. Yeah. We got one, a so, couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we got, got them. Them. They all, they all, they all jumped the ship. So, so, so Steve, I don't know if you, 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 uh, you haven't been caught up on that, but you know the coloring department had nothing to do with the purchase, right? Okay, that's what yeah. I understood. But tell me, the story. no, yeah, that so, was so, that was the yeah that was the story going around. Yeah, that's the, yeah, and that's it. It persists still to this day. You can you can Google it I, and find it. That that's that's I what just the said. Is. But but <laughs> Marvel actually did not like the coloring department at all. They they couldn't stand it. Um, they didn't. Uh, the editorial certainly didn't like it. They didn't want to use it. They almost had to be pressed to use it um, because of, of schedules. Uh, the reality is, right, so it, it was, and this, I don't know if it'll make you mad or, or happy, I don't know, but it was simply corporate maneuvering because DC had been doing, they, 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 yep, they had been, do, and they'd been doing due diligence. I mean, they've been in the offices studying the books, going through the records, you know, seeing, is this a, is this a business that we want to buy? Can we buy this? And they've been doing it for months, right? Well, um, at the time, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but at the time, you know, Marvel was about 40, you know, 45 percent of the market share. DC was some somewhere around 30, 35, something mm -hmm. like that. That sounds right. Yeah. And, and, and Malibu was a, a, a solid third, depending on what Dark Horse published that month. Right. Right. If Dark Horse yeah. did Aliens and or something like that, we were fourth. Right? I remember that. Yes. So we had about a 15 percent market share at the time, roughly. And if DC had purchased Malibu, that would have propelled the market share higher than, than Marvel. Marvel had just gone uh, public. And so if you look at what, um, I forget the guy's name, but if you look what their CEO was doing, he was buying up properties. Pearl, Perlman? Uh, Perlman. Perlman, yeah. Perlman. Okay, Perlman. Um, and so he was going around buying up properties in, in an effort yeah. to say, look what I'm doing. I'm growing the company. I'm, you know, we're now public. I'm growing it, blah, blah, blah. Well, when everything crashed, what's the first thing they do? Uh, when they, they fired the guy, brought in a new guy. And what does he do? He kills everything. He killed Panini stickers. He killed Heroes World. And he killed, uh, he killed Malibu Comics. It was, it was 
simply corporate maneuvering. They just tried to Marvel bought us simply to keep us out of the hands of DC. The coloring department, as much as we would like to think it had something to do with it, had nothing to do with it. Okay, that's good. Enough. That's good. Enough. That's that's a good cool story. It's a it's a sadder wow. story actually. It is, it a is sadder. sadder. Story. It oh, really yeah. is. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, it's just it's just corporate maneuvering. They just didn't want. It, it, to it certainly it. makes sense though, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. It does. Uh, does anyone have any any more questions for Steve? Some of our our latecomers, Haley or Brent. Um, I got one. I'm not sure he wants to uh, wants to go into because it's a long winded question. And, you know, we try to be super positive uh, on here, but I, so I don't want you to, if it's going to take you in that direction, don't go. So, um, so, <laughs> uh, so, so I've told you multiple times when you and I first started working together, I was, uh, I've always been a huge fan of your work and, and of the, the defenders, the Avengers, that period of time, uh, Big fan of that stuff. I love those stories. I love what, what was going on there. I I like a lot of what Marvel did in that, not just you, but a lot of what Marvel did in that in that era. Shortly after that, Shooter comes in and and explodes the, 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 the DC, I'm sorry, the, the Marvel universe exploded in the sense of sales and popularity. Um I am a fan of what I hear of what Shooter talks about it's, it's, uh, as far as stories go. His, his uh, I don't, did you ever see his blog, Steve? No. I see, uh, 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 Jim Shooter's got a blog that he did. Uh, he hasn't done it in years, but he did several episodes. But he talks about you know his ideas of what makes a good story, how to do continued story, how to do uh these these kinds of things what he even goes into some of the new 52 and talks about why these uh, particular issues are bad so, so Does he, you don't need a lot of experience to, you know. <laughs> no, no but uh, zing, zing, zing. <laughs> so so you were there though when you went from the kind of the, the revolving door of editors in chiefs to shooter Right. Right. So I guess my question is kind of like, what kind of changes did you see as far as from a writer's perspective from story? Right. I'm looking at what is what what was the focus on story from free shooter to shooter? Well, shooter, I don't know that the stories. Well, there was okay. Let's see what I can come up with here. Shooter. Shooter had rules. Shooter, yes. had, yeah. in his mind, he had figured out how things should be done, mm -hmm. and so you had to you had to play by his rules theoretically. When I was when I came back, I had enough clout, you know, and getting me back was a thing and all that. Yeah. Um, that he didn't really lean into them with me, but he had rules like. No sound effects, because really? in real life, you don't see letters flying through the sky. His, his thing was always Ooh. in real life, right? I mean, he came up with that whole universe, two or whatever it was called. Like like <laughs> comics are real life. Yeah. And, you know, it has to be like okay. real life. I didn't um, know the sound effects. And, and <laughs> that's the kind of thing that I didn't really agree with, you know? Yeah. And he, and, but he had another rule, which is... <laughs> He had another rule that you can't say the word supervillain because in real life, nobody talks about supervillains. And I said to him, yeah, but in the Marvel universe, <laughs> right. they would distinguish between a guy who knocked off the corner liquor store and Dr. Doom. They would create a word, <laughs> yes. they would create a word for these big ticket guys. Absolutely, you know? yeah. yeah. And, he, and when I explained that to him, he goes, Serial oh, yeah. Killer. yeah, okay. And so he... he lost that rule he gave up on that rule because huh. i because i was able to, so that's how i approach shooter it's like right he was he was not the editor that i was talking about earlier who would let you do anything right i mean right. Shooter, he, but he let me do basically what i wanted to do but every once in a while he would come around and he would go eh. and the other thing about shooter um was that he did tend to turn on people. He'd get, you know, he'd decide somebody was his enemy and, and really go after him. 
I had heard oh. that before I went back. I saw it happen while I was there. It never mm. happened to me. But yeah. but Ralph Macchio, who is a weasel. <laughs> oh, hey. Ooh. Ooh. Shots fired. Um, yeah. <laughs> but Macchio told me later, Shooter was just kid. about to come for you. Shooter was Shooter was working his way up, and he was just about to come for you when you left the next time, right? Wow. So it could be that I, you know, that I just dodged a bullet there. And then later, I worked for him at Valiant, right? Um, and and once again, ran into his rules. One of his rules that he will tell you how he taught Frank Miller to draw. Yeah. is that all panels should be shot from a mid-distance. You don't want mm. close-ups, and you don't want faraway things. You want the mid-distance, because yeah. that's how television works. And so that's, you know, oh. how comics are supposed well, to work. There's so close-ups in TV. And he, Yeah, but, I mean, he would do stuff like that, and you would go, but Jim, but he was, you know, he was pretty adamant. In, mm -hmm. in regards to a lot of yeah. those things, mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah just have I remember to like... Mike Zek saying he he was he just was would mm -hmm. rip him a new one on, on Secret Wars. Yeah, he, just, he, he would send art in, and he just he'd make him redo whole sections of the book. Oh my god! Yeah, uh, yeah, it just drove him nuts. Was he trying to yeah. craft you know, a particular style that would be known to him? Sorry, and everything it, was he making a certain style that everyone would recognize as his. Uh, I don't think so because the art did look different depending on who was drawing it. But I mean, that was just one of his overall rules. He had certain storytelling rules that right. he wanted to see done. Right. You know? And uh, and he if, it, they, if you didn't use them, he made you redo it. So you did use them. Is what I heard. So well, yeah. Uh, and and this is this is a little addendum here. But I did work for him at Valiant, and I was going to do a book called Shadow Man. Yeah. Um, and he said, he got four pages into XO Man of War and said, I don't have time to write this, but would you write it for me sounding like me? Because I believe, like Stan, that every, all books should sound the same too, right? But if you do this for me, when you write your book, you can write it the way you want to write it. And so I wrote four issues, whatever, of XO, and then came Shadow Man, and I wrote the first issue. And he came to me and he said, I know what I told you, oh, no, but I no. can't do it. He said, I can't have a book that sounds this different from everything else. And and you can tell people that, you know, he says, I, you know, I promised you something and I'm having to go back on it because I firmly believe that that's what I have to do. But, you know, go ahead and tell people. And so over the next 20 years or whatever, it came up half a dozen times, and I would say, yeah, Shooter was a stand-up guy about the whole thing. I mean, he had yeah. these weird rules, and he did this, and he did that. And then, like about, I don't know, early 2000s, somebody showed me, probably his blog, where he said, Engelhart was always insubordinate, and that's why I had to get rid of him. <laughs> and I thought, God damn it, Jim. I've been telling everybody what a nice guy you were this whole time. Yeah. Oh, no. And now, oh. and now you don't want to take, you know, you don't want to yeah. hear that story anymore, I guess, or whatever. So um, Shooter was complicated. And, and yeah. I, didn't, I didn't super enjoy working for him. But it wasn't like the worst thing in the world either, you know. Yeah. I mean, because you knew him by that time. I mean, mm -hmm. that kind of nothing that I just said came as like, a complete surprise right uh, you know so um but i you know but i don't roland you said you agreed with him on a lot of his things and i don't know but i mean i i i don't know which ones you agree on but i'm but i still think you know i would say editors are there to like facilitate and so yes. forth, but not to not to put up fences and say you can't go there because you're I, not your people yeah. are not going to be able to like go where they need to go, you know? Well, I mean, certainly Silverline does not need to, they don't all need to sound alike. That's, they well, don't. No. <laughs> they, and they don't. don't. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. Or look so, alike. Yeah, they don't look I, alike, I can, they don't sound alike. That's not what we want to do. Yeah. I can also vouch for the fact that uh, Roland is much more Roy Thomas than Jim Shooter. <laughs> yeah. As far as, I mean, even, even when Roland has a suggestion, you know, and I typically ignore it, but no, I, I listen to Roland, <laughs> but uh, he's very, very fair. And 
it, when he has a point, you know, he has a point and, okay. and he's easy to work with. So, well, I'm just saying, know. I hope, you know, I, I'm glad. Good. Cause yeah. if a guy's got limits on what you right. can do, right. You know, I mean, there may be, there may be a reason here or there on this particular thing, why you have to do this, that, or the other thing. But I, I think everybody should roam as free as they possibly can. You know, you've never had any yeah. editorial input Free on the range community. <laughs> well, I had a little, yeah. Barb, Barb, because your stories are so good. Roll, there's a comment there, Roland. I don't, uh, Dean. Which one here? What, uh, where they met Roland at Three Rivers, uh, which was just uh, last well, week. Here we which go. was a blast. Ooh. Rory and Roland and I were there in Pittsburgh. Uh, yep. They finished Trump's. Uh, did you see that one? Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, What's up, yeah. Tacoma? Yeah. Finished Trump's. Heck and yeah. I just yeah. wanted to let yeah. you know I thought it was great. So it was a blast. Was Thank a blast. you so much, Sagoma. Thank you, Sagoma. We had a, like Roy and I had a comment too about our comic, so so it was cool. It's fun. Cool. It's fun. Nice. It was a great very weekend. Nice. Very nice. Oh, God, it was it. a lot of fun. I'm gonna probably uh, wrap this up pretty yep. soon if that's okay. Oh that's yeah, we're, we're, oh, oh, we we usually we, end at eight at the on uh, the we, half we, hour. So we yeah. end up at okay. eight thirty anyway. We want to uh give our heartfelt appreciation for you spending time with us tonight, Steve. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure. As always, brought back a lot of memories. Let's give let's yes. give Steve a hand. Great right hearing your Round voice of again. applause. Thank you, Steve. Steve, everybody. Thank yeah. you. And uh, as we close out, we always like to close out the same way uh, before we roll the closing bumper, and we like to say something along the lines of "Make my mind." Good night, Hi, I'm Greg Horn. Make mine silver line. Oh, he bailed. Who is?